There is probably no prophet, a minor prophet anyways, that is more well known than the one that we are going to look at this morning. It is possible that his message of repentance, it led to more salvation decisions than any other prophet used by God. It is estimated that about 120,000 people repented and started to follow God after hearing this, met, met, this prophet's short, little, pithy message. The most memorable aspect of this prophet's entire life was a result of hearing God and refusing to willingly follow Him. That's what he's known for. All of Scripture... As we begin to look at this, it is so relatable. Everything in God's Word, it is so practical. It is incredibly convicting as we come across what God's Word teaches. Ask yourself, how many times do you or I read God's Word, clearly know what God's Word says, yet fail to obey it? And now, go a little bit further. How many times do we do that when we know full well what it says, and we intentionally and willfully reject what it says? As I even say that, there's one verse that the Lord has just emblazoned on my heart uh, for the, the, the last several years that just really speaks volumes to me, and that is James 4, 17. This is what it says. It says, therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. This strips away all of the excuses. Everything that you or I can possibly come to to try to justify our behavior, and it gets directly at the heart. That's what this does. When we hear God and know the truth of God's word. But we reject it. And we deliberately defy it. That's sin. Let me put it bluntly. Whenever we read the Bible, or we hear a sermon, or we somehow come in contact with scriptural truth, and we fail to apply it to our lives, according to God's standard which is the only standard that matters, that's sin. Even as I share that thought, all of my human flesh, and maybe yours, it just kind of balks at all that. I want to balk at every aspect of that. I want to justify and excuse away my failures. I'm not that bad. I try to cross-compare. I look to other people that are worse than me, and I'm like, oh, not him. That, that's how we tend to be. Again, that's honestly why Scripture is so relatable and it is incredibly convicting. Because we really can empathize with this familiar prophet. Sometimes, if we are not careful, we can hear God's Word and regrettably, regretfully, we refuse to willingly follow his lead and direction. <clears throat> Let me be very clear. There is never a valid excuse for doing that. A little history lesson. Following the death of King Solomon, okay, you have Saul, David, Solomon, unified kingdom. Following the death of the final king over the unified kingdom, Solomon. Following his death, it is split into two kingdoms. You've got the north, which is Israel, and you've got the south, which is Judah. The north, Israel, it has 19 kings. And every single one of those kings were bad. Now I want to pause and just let you know, when I say bad, what I actually mean. It does not mean that Israel did not prosper. Because there were seasons through this time that Israel actually prospered. What I mean by that right, is that they rejected God and they ruled Israel without following God's lead. That's my definition of bad. And that's how God defines bad. 
they were bad things. But again, it does not mean that there was an economic collapse. It doesn't mean that they faced immediate ruin. Actually, God was incredibly patient with this group of people, with Israel. For about 200 years, they existed as the north. Until God finally said, enough is enough. And there's one particular king, which is at the, the helm of all of this. He's the king that's on the throne when all of this situation with this book of the Bible takes place. That is the king Jeroboam II. And he reigned from about 793 B.C. And during his reign, Israel experienced once again this prosperity. <laughs> They started to really flourish as a nation financially. They had a lot of securities. Their, their army was strong. However, when you look historically at this whole picture that I just described, there was one main, really nasty opponent to Israel. And that was the nation of Assyria. The Assyrians, they were particularly cruel they were awful and ruthless. When they capture an enemy, let me just give you a couple of highlights of some of the lowlights, actually, of what this nation would do to people. They would rake their victims' bodies with metal. And they would just peel off their skin and leave them there to die. They would come in and they would cut off their, their enemies, their victims' heads, and they would put them on stakes, and they would spread them out all over their conquered area as a way to deter anyone else from rebelling. This is just an absolutely disgusting thing. The Assyrians were just nasty, awful people known for their cruelty. And in light of that, I just want to show a very short clip to just give you a little bit more of a historical feel and understanding about the Assyrian line. So here it is. This time's amazing. So this is a really nasty territory, nasty nation that lived to the northeast of Israel. And the capital of Assyria is Nineveh. And these were the dirty, rotten, filthy sinners which God called Jonah the prophet to go to and to preach repentance of sin. For those of you that are just joining us, we have embarked upon a journey, and we are committed to go through each of the minor prophets. And we're going to look at them, we're going to study them, and God is going to take them, as he has done in years gone by, and he is going to continue to stoke us and just draw a fire as we dig into those. But these minor prophets, I want to explain, these are not insignificant individuals. Their message that was entrusted to them, it was also not a minor message either. Why they are called minor prophets is simply because of the length of their book compared to the major prophets. The major had big chapters and lots of material where the minor prophets had just a little space in God's Word. So that's the only reason why they are minor prophets. But today, we are going to begin our exploration of the book of Jonah. This is a story about a prophet who heard God and ran the opposite direction. It's a story of a prophet who had contempt against the nasty Ninevites. It's a story of a prophet whose heart wasn't in the message, but it didn't stop God from drawing 120,000 people into himself. Let me read today's main text. It's Jonah... Chapter 1, 1 through 3a. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose <coughs> up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. These opening three verses, it includes a cast of characters. There's really three main casts of characters that we see. The first one is the Lord himself. This is one who is 
full of grace and mercy for all of mankind. That's the God that we serve. That's the one that you see all throughout Scripture, specifically in this book. You've got Jonah. He's a prophet who is tasked by God with the responsibility to communicate this message of repentance to Nineveh. And then you've got Nineveh, the wicked and vile nation, which is blinded and lost in their brokenness. They are headed toward God's looming wrath. Let me just say, personally, I am really, really grateful for the small missionary family, the Timbuktu, who came to my church that one particular Sunday morning, and in junior church, they shared the gospel message, and my heart broke. I am so grateful that they were sensitive enough to God's meeting, that that message was laid before me at that time, and I trusted the Lord as my Savior at an early age. Even as I say that, the only thing that really truly separates me from the same awful looming wrath that the Ninevites deserved, and we're going to see very clearly they deserved it, it is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. If I never placed my faith in the personal work of Jesus, I would still be lost. <clears throat> and dead in my trespasses and my vile sin. Thankfully, my story doesn't stop at the sewage of sin. Our sovereign God sent His Son, Jesus, to offer me and anyone else salvation. You understand that? Salvation is only through Jesus. And He sends it out to anyone. This is an offer for any and every individual to receive God's grace and mercy. What a blessing. Today, our message it is entitled, Nineveh, Never Too Far Gone. So before we go any further, let's go. Dear Lord, I thank you. <laughs> there is really no other proper response than just exultation to praise your holy name for what you've done. Lord, I'm not worthy. It's not about me. It's all about what you have done and how you, Lord, get tremendous glory from extending grace to the unworthy. And so, God, I pray today as we read this, as we study this, as we talk about today, that you would speak through this nation of men. That you would speak to this prophet who ran. And that you would lead us to a place, Lord, that we would simply trust and obey. That we would follow you. That we would give you the blank check of our life and let you do whatever you want. Lord, we thank you for who you are, that we can trust you no matter what. And that you are so good to us. Help us to see that this morning. And we love you. And we pray this in your precious name. Amen. Jonah 1, 1. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, okay? Basically, what this, this hall opens up, God <coughs> intentionally interrupts and intersects Jonah's life. Make that personal. Aren't you glad that God makes a habit of doing that with our lives? While God might not show up exactly like we expect or maybe even anticipate, God is intimately involved. And God pursues each and every one of us. So in this story, as it opens up, God emphatically came to Jonah. And he comes to Jonah with a specific purpose. To be very clear, this was not the first time that God had done this in coming to Jonah. And it won't be the last time we'll also see in this book. But previously, the Lord, he had used Jonah to encourage his own people, that northern kingdom of Israel. And you can see that, you can read about it in 2 Kings 14 if you want to. But this time, when God comes to Jonah, 
He has another assignment. And this secondary assignment is just a little bit harder, maybe for Jonah, and maybe for us as we read this to digest. This is what he says in Jonah 1, 1 through 2. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Arise. That word it is a command from God. And it means to stand up. There's also some interesting elements that are attached to this command. It's a verb that is used, and there are some aspects that we might lose in our English. But this is what it means. It means to stand up and endure. That's an aspect that's attached to this idea of standing up. It means to be fixed by standing. To be proven by standing. To persist while you stand. God was commanding Jonah to a decisive action. He wants him to arise and go. Basically what he's saying is do something with what I am about to instruct you. It's honestly the same root command which God ends up giving to Abram in uh, Genesis. To go and take action to be follow, uh, and follow my instruction. That's what he says to Abram, and Abram does just that. It's the same type of command. Specifically for Jonah, though, God, he was telling him to go to Nineveh, the capital of this nasty, wicked, pagan, and foreign nation, the direct enemy of Israel. And not just go there on a vacation, but to go there with the purpose of preaching to them a message of repentance. Think about it. The one true God, the creator of everything, the almighty and holy God of Scripture, He has seen your wickedness. God knows everything. That is an absolutely terrifying thought to those who are presently in rebellion and living in rejection to God. That is a knee-knocking thought. But Jonah, who is God's prophet, another way to say that he is God's mouthpiece, he was to go to this wicked city of Nineveh, and he was to preach to them to turn from their sins to God. We've talked a lot already today about some of the nastiness of the city. All the atrocities that they committed. It's just unthinkable. And they did it directly against their neighbors, which Israel was one of them. There was no nation that was safe from their terror. The northern kingdom of Israel, God's people, they had experienced firsthand the cruelty and the ruthlessness of the Assyrians. Jonah, an inhabitant of that nation, Israel, he understood what the Assyrians were capable of doing to those that they didn't like, to those that got under their skin, to those that just were in their path at the wrong time. So for Jonah... To arise and go. Put yourself into his shoes. He's going to those people. It was probably a scary proposition, at least humanly speaking, to go to a place that it could have very seriously lost in his life. And then you think about the other end, after experiencing firsthand some of that atrocity, it was probably also incredibly frustrating because from Jonah's perspective, Nineveh only deserved destruction. He's there to go to preach the idea of repentance. Why would God send a message of repentance? Think about that with me. The idea of repentance... What that truly, honestly means, it implies that God was giving them a chance to repent. Jonah was like, no! Not okay, God! 
It was one thing to be a prophet to God's own people, Israel. It is another thing altogether to go to Nineveh. I have to believe this is a thought that festered, and it further frustrated Jonah. Nineveh didn't deserve God's mercy. The only fitting action should be for God to exterminate them. For God to completely eradicate them and wipe them off the face of the earth. That's justice. And that is what Nineveh truly deserved. Can I just tell you, this week as I was preparing this message, my mind went to the countless number of people who have been violated and abused by somebody else. That hurt that they feel is real. The pain that they have had to endure is real. The memories that still are there and plague them they're haunting. What was done to those innocent individuals, it was inexcusable. And while there is a part of us which longs for justice, and I think every one of us would feel that way when we see an atrocity like that, can I just tell you, it is equally wrong for us to become bitter, and resentful. And it's so easy to do it. Let me just remind us, we are not the perfect judge. The only one that is in that position, which is truly qualified to hold being the perfect judge, is holy and holy God. That is it. And I believe, okay, I'm going to digress for just a second. I believe a fundamental problem which all of us can fall into if we are not careful. And I want you to hear this. We can make salvation about us. That is a huge theological problem that every one of us can face if we're not careful. While it is truly marvelous that God bestows His grace on each and every one of us, who profess Him, the emphasis of salvation is not on us. It is on God's grace. All that you or I ever bring to the equation is our brokenness. We bring our failures. We bring our insurmountable death. That's what we offer. The depths of our sin, just the little taste that we begin to see, it shows our incredible need. Here's the truth. God calls me. God changes me. God cleanses me. And God conforms me to His image. Salvation, it has always been... And it will always be about God and His grace. When we begin to recognize salvation from sin clearly, the way that God wants us to see it, the way Scripture reveals it, who are we to withhold God's grace from anyone else? There is honestly no difference in God's eyes between those who violated us, those who have abused us, and those ruthless and cruel, wicked and detestable people of Nineveh. Apart from God's grace and mercy, we are all enemies of God. The book of Romans makes that crystal clear. Flip over with me to the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Romans chapter 5, this is what it says in verses 6 through 11. <clears throat> For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. 
For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. It is only through the shed blood of Jesus that any of us have been forgiven. Christ's death, what it does is it satisfies God's wrath. And it does it perfectly. And faith in Christ it is the only remedy that brings us into a right relationship with God. What happens is Jesus, the term is reconciled, but Jesus brings us back into a right relationship and a right standing with God through His shed blood. Not only does Jesus' substitutionary sacrifice satisfy God's wrath, but this passage, it highlights it actually breathes life into our dead and decaying soul. Jesus gives us an abundant life, one that is united and attached to Him through Christ. So, a proper perspective of salvation, which truly emphasizes God's grace to broken, wicked, and vile sinners like you and I. It helps us to process the command that God gives to Jonah to arise and go to that despicable city of Nineveh and to preach repentance. God, the only qualified judge, he knows their wickedness. God is fully aware of every single detail of it, way more than you or I. And it is God's prerogative if he decides to offer mercy or if he decides to enact swift and crushing judgment. I want you to listen to how Jonah responds to God's command to go. This is what it says in Jonah 1, 1 through 3a. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish in the presence of the Lord. Jonah runs from God. Jonah gets up. He does the first part. He rises. But he doesn't go. He goes the exact opposite direction. And he travels roughly about 2,000 miles away to what is present-day Spain. This is a blatant refusal and rejection of God's command. Basically, what Jonah is saying is, I know what you are asking, God, and I know what you want, but no. Nope, not going to do it. The people of Nineveh, they are horrible they don't deserve your mercy. And if your prophet does not preach, then they can't repent. What a sad, short-sighted, and insufficient view of God that is. Flip over with me. Middle of the Bible, Psalm. Psalm 86. I want to read the first ten verses. Listen to what this says about who God is. Match that up with what Jonah 
in his insufficient mind was thinking. This is what God is like. It says this in, in Psalm 86, 1 through 10. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me. For I am afflicted and need. Preserve my soul, for I am a godly man. O you, my God, save your servant who trusts in you. Be gracious to me, O Lord. For to you I cry all day long. Make glad the soul of your servant. For to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in kindness to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. And give heed to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble, I shall call upon you, for you will answer me. <clears throat> there is no one like you among the gods of the world. Nor are there any works like yours. All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord. And they shall glorify your name, for you are great and do wondrous deeds. You alone are God. This is a psalm of David. And David he cries out to God from a state of great need. David, he is entirely entrusting himself into God's hands. David desires God to be gracious and forgiving to him. This is why David is crying out to God in prayer. That's a snapshot of our God. This is the same exact God that is available to all who call upon him. You understand, as this passage says, our God is good. He is always ready to forgive. That is part of his abundant loving kindness toward us. No matter how much that we have blown it, no matter how much that you or I maybe have made a mess of things, all because of our desire to sin or our wandering rebellious hearts, no matter how far gone we are, God is able to and willing to extend forgiveness to us. That's the beauty of the gospel. That is why it is good news. Because the state that we are all naturally in is that of Nineveh. We are all Ninevites. We need God. Apart from Him, we are all facing the looming wrath of God. But in but God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the purpose of Jesus. He came to this earth for a purpose, to seek and to save that which is lost, to redeem, to fix, all the evil and brokenness that we live in that infiltrates us. We need help. And the only help any of us can have is Christ. You understand, no one is ever too far gone for God's mercy. Not the filthy, rotten, wicked, and evil people of Nineveh, and not any of us equally vile and broken people. Everyone needs God's grace, which is only received through faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. God's grace, it is offered to all who will accept it. And the finished work of Christ, it covers the most vile offender because it's not about what you have done, it's not about what you are presently involved in. It is about what God has done to fix it. That's God's grace. It's a message of God's grace. And it is only that that causes us to get to a place 
where we can see things from God's perspective and truly start to appreciate God's grace just a little bit. Jonah, as I processed his life, I really truly believe he struggled to see how sovereign God could forgive him. <coughs> to Jonah, they were a nation that was too far gone. But thankfully, God saw this situation drastically different. I am so glad that God sees me not as I naturally am, but that he sees me through the shed blood of his son, Jesus. It is only because of that that I am never too far gone. So let's make this real practical. Let's make this real personal. I don't know where you are today. I don't know where you are when it comes to your relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you don't have one. Maybe this is the first time you've ever heard the name of Jesus. Maybe this is the first time you've ever opened God's word. Can I tell you God loves you? In that while you're yet a sinner, while you are in rebellion against him, God still loves you. God's been pursuing you. God desires you. Soak that up for a second. That's just part of the reason that we have a good, good God. So now ask yourself, is there ever been a time where you have acknowledged, I can't live up to God's standard of perfection? I've blown it. I see it all the time. I just can't measure up. I fail. My sin is ever before my eyes. That's what David says. If that's you, if that's where you're at, can I encourage you to say, may, may I encourage you to stop fighting, stop struggling with that, and just surrender? Confess, that's the word, it means I agree with God about what God says about me. I can't, and that's why Jesus did. Has there ever been a time in your life where you have stopped trying and just trusted in the grace of God? Asked him, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I've blown it. There's no difference between me and those nasty Ninevites. I need help. I need repentance. Repentance is just simply a 180 degree turn. I'm heading in a direction, and I stop. And I turn. And by God's grace, I go in the opposite direction. Has that ever happened in your life? Do you have an active, living, vibrant relationship with Jesus? If any of these questions that I'm asking, you're like, eh, I don't think so. Eh, I'm trying. I'm thinking. I just think I'm not there. Please do not leave today without talking with me. Talk to somebody else. There is nothing we would rather talk to you about than the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what we all need. Because it is where hope is found for us who can't live up. And for us who can't live up, <laughs> can I encourage you? Preach this to one another. Talk to one another about the goodness of our God. Remind each other of how good He has been to us. Do not take that for granted. It is so easy to get lost in the difficulties that we face that we sometimes lower who our God is. Maybe you needed to hear today that salvation is not about you. It's not about me. It's about the God we serve and the grace He's extended. Ooh, that takes so much of the weight off our shoulders. We live in God's grace. Don't take that for Use every moment to bring him glory and honor. Not out of obligation, but out of reciprocation. And remember, no matter what you face in this life, if your fellowship right now, maybe you're like the prodigal son, you've gone away, and you find yourself in the muck and the mire, you're among the pigs, and you're broken. You're not too far gone. Cry out to the Lord, and He will restore that sweet, sweet fellowship. I don't know 
where you are. But there's something in there for all of us. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your forgiveness. I thank you for your love. And Lord, I thank you for that day in the future of that perfect justice that is coming. That is based upon your holy righteousness. I thank you that you are the only one qualified to be that judge. That's not a place I have to worry about. Not because of anything I've ever done, Lord, but only because of Christ. It is through that that I have, ex I have experienced your grace and mercy. It is because of that, Lord, that I am capable of extending grace and mercy. Lord, help us. We need it. All of us, if we're not careful, we can fall into the kingdom of Jonah, and we can see those that we think are too far gone, and we can disregard them. The truth is, it is messy. And sometimes it's scary to step out and to go in and, inse and intersect someone else's life. That's a scary thing where it could mean rejection. It could even mean death. But Lord, it's not about us. Salvation is never about us. We're just the product that you save. Salvation is all about your grace. And it magnifies the glory you deserve. Help us to see that today, fresh and clear from your perspective. And may you get glory and honor from all. We praise your precious name. Amen. Amen.